Hey, everybody. Oh, there's some selfies on stage. Okay, that's fun. Am I, am I in it? Okay, now I'm in it. <laughs> Don't everyone do that. <laughs> uh, great talk with Shaq. Uh, that's like, I think the only guest that I've played as in NBA Jam, probably, that we've had. Uh, so that's something. All right, but next up, stick around. Great chat coming up, great discussion we have with uh, our very own brand new editor-in-chief, Connie Loizos, and she's going to be talking to a guest who has a very famous father, but also he is making news in his own right with a new $200 million venture fund specifically looking to invest in tech to help fight cancer. So he apparently never thought that he would be a VC, uh, wanted to be a doctor, and ended up doing this instead, and we'll hear why he took this path. Uh, so let's welcome out Connie and Reed Jobs. Hey everyone. So Reed, thank you so much for joining us today. My absolute pleasure, Connie. Uh, and I want to echo that congratulations to you uh, as you assume this great new role as editor-in-chief. Oh, thank you. That's so sweet of you to say. Yeah, thank absolutely. You thank you. <laughs> um, so, Reed, you have one of the most famous names, last names in Silicon Valley, yet people don't know you yet. Um, what would you like for them to know about you? Oh, that's such a nice question. Uh, you know, all I really care about in this world is making a huge difference for cancer patients. And what we really do at Yosemite and what I've wanted to do my entire life is to make cancer non-lethal in our lifetimes. Uh, if we can be a part of that, that is exactly what I want to do and what I would love to be known for. Uh, but ultimately, n you know, notoriety is uh, really low on my list of priorities. Uh, what I really care about the most is being involved with amazing science, but especially making great companies and translating those into patients as soon as possible because patients are the ultimate uh, arbiters for how well we're doing. So patient difference is really what we're at. And so you have a specific plan to do that. So you took the wraps off of a venture fund last month, I guess, or uh, yes, last month, a $200 million venture fund, and you run alongside it a donor-advised fund. So tell me a little bit about what you have cooking there. So it's a structure that we actually have pioneered at Yosemite. So it's pretty unusual, and it's something that I'd love to get an opportunity to talk about because yeah. it's something that we're very excited to debut, but also something that we hope other people will eventually copy. So the way that it works is our venture fund is a very traditional venture fund, uh, with one big exception. And that is that there's a percentage of the fund, it's small, it's only 2.5%, mm. that goes into a donor advised fund, which is a uh, type of nonprofit entity that one doesn't own, but that they can still direct. That capital is then earmarked for grants, mm. which is far more akin to seed funding in the biotech ecosystem than it would be philanthropy in other areas. And the reason why we're doing this is we've really piloted this at Emerson, mm. and through partnering with the best researchers in the world on their best projects, we then can not only de-risk science that we then turn into companies, but we also get a network of the best KOLs in the world. And at, we've done this long enough that we've been lucky to support about 500 labs so far wow. and have a really big footprint across the academic ecosystem. Uh, that, those are you know, connections and insights that we're going to be able to take with us as we make our investment decisions too. I want to pause though and just mention the way that we've structured this means that we have absolutely no IP or royalty rights to any of the grants that we do. Uh, I, I like to keep things really simple and really easy. And for me, that really means when we do a venture investment, we have to look at it on its merits of profitability and scalability. Mm -hmm. But when we do grants, we don't take any IP strings and we just do it as a pure philanthropic gift. That's great. And I'm just curious, when you're dealing with donor advised funds, do the donors have any say in how that money is distributed or that's entirely uh, up, up to you? Uh, that's entirely at our discretion. Okay. And so this is sort of analogous to what you were doing at Emerson Collective, your mother's philanthropic and business organization. So why did you feel compelled to start your own thing, Yosemite? Absolutely. So Emerson has had uh, you know, branches of it scale out in the public markets before. Uh, there's a 
group called Earthshot, which is a fantastic fund that works on the climate space, which similarly has now taken on external capital outside of Emerson. Uh, so for my team, it was a real natural evolution. Uh, I'll tell you, I, we're really proud to debut this model because it's something that other people can actually replicate. There's nothing here that's the province of cancer. You could absolutely do this for neurodegenerative diseases, for autoimmune diseases, and we hope other people will. Uh, and then finally, uh, my team and I are, you know, all of a similar uh, stage in our lives, and we uh, wanted a little independence. We wanted to have our own firm, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's great. Um, I just wondered, you know, this does kind of put you in the public spotlight maybe for the first time, and you've already said it's nothing that you're terribly interested in. I'm just wondering how that feels. It feels like a remarkable privilege and honor to be able to promote great science, great research, and really uh, educate people on the fact that what we've done and seen in cancer outcomes in just the last 20 years is the very beginning of what is likely to happen over the next 20 years. And that is the optimization and really the dissemination of next generation therapies, uh, mostly immunotherapies, but gene editing ones as well, to a broader range of diseases. So uh, on a, just to give you one small example, uh, so I started working in cancer labs when my father got sick uh, really as soon as I could. Uh, you know, he was diagnosed when I was 12. I, at 15, started working in uh, labs at Stanford. And at that point, what was really cutting edge was uh, genomic sequencing. Mm. And I worked in a lab of uh, colorectal cancer, and it was a type of that which was hereditary. Uh, and it was a terrible outcome. I mean, people would get colectomies at 35. It was almost a guaranteed uh, you know, di you know, prognosis of getting colon cancer in your lifetime. Uh, really, really terrible. And you know, we found the certain mutational signatures there, and basically it had a crazy load of mutations, like millions of mutations. These cells were so out of control. But from the beginning of immunotherapy, when it began to be tested in that, the difference between those cancer cells and the rest of your body is so stark that even today's immunotherapy works marvelously in that type of colon cancer. Mm. And in my lifetime, I've already seen one area go from just absolute, you know, really, really poor prognosis to something now that is widely treatable and has a really great long-term survival rate. So that's one example, but it's very illustrative of what we're seeing now with just the first iteration of this technology. Uh, optimizing things like immunotherapy, CAR T cells, it'll take quite a while. Biotech is you know, much slower than tech, which is unfortunate, mm -hmm. but we have to be really deliberate and safe. And as we get and optimize those to the rest of the market, we're really excited to bring them out to a lot of, a, a lot of other indications. That's great. You know, I'm just curious, Daryl mentioned that you never wanted to be a venture capitalist, <laughs> and I know that you studied pre-med. Did you ever think about starting a company, or do you just feel like you can have much more impact doing what you're doing? Well, I think I can have a, a much more impact doing what I'm doing at, at this stage. Uh, given the trends in the market, uh, and really in science, it's really outpacing uh, what any one company is likely able to do. Uh, I also, you know, am just innately very competitive. And, you know, my family, if you're going to start a company, it's, it's got to be a hit. <laughs> it's a tall bar, I'm sure, in, in the Jobs household. Um, I wanted to ask, oh, if you had taken any of your team with you. I just met one of your wonderful colleagues, Anna, who I know uh, came from Thrive Capital. Just yes, I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, we brought, actually, the entire investment team. Oh, okay, uh, great. From what was previously the Emerson Collective Health Team in Yosemite. So our track record and experience, uh, that's all carried over, oh, great. Uh, which I'm very proud of. We, we didn't lose anybody. Okay, because I was wondering what would make sort of like a Yosemite company investment versus Emerson. But Emerson's not doing this at all anymore. Uh, that's correct. Emerson's no longer doing life science investing. Uh, they will still do some uh, healthcare, you know, tech investing. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the life sciences side, that's really now through Yosemite. Okay. So cancer cures, broadly speaking, is what you're focused on. Um, how do you think about your approach? I mean, how many different sort of baskets are you looking at and what, what is your priority here? Um, well, again, we like to say we want to make cancer non-lethal. We're mm -hmm. wary of the word cure. It's been abused yeah. in this industry a lot. And, you know, we really want to be very cautious about what we're going to be uh, promising that we can deliver here. 
But ultimately, uh, the, I'd say the three areas we really focus on are early detection, mm. uh, which is so critical. I mean, every cancer we have a way to detect it early, you have a commensurately lower mortality. And you know, right now we have you know, some great ones like PSA, mammograms, colonoscopies. Those are, you know, work quite well. But you know, for the rest of cancers, it's really, really a crapshoot. And more often than not, things are caught when they're late and they're metastatic and they're far more dangerous. So things like liquid biopsies uh, and actually a lot of AI in you know, scans like MRIs and PTs are, have become really, really precise at picking up early cancer markers. Uh, we're still in the early days of the liquid biopsy space, but that's an area that is going to be increasingly important uh, for catching things early. And once you do that, you just have far more options. Um, so that's one vertical that we've been incredibly devoted in for quite a long time. Um, the second one is something I mentioned earlier, uh, which is immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. You know, ultimately, your body is the best defense mechanism that you have. Your body's so amazing. I'm, I'm always just in awe of it. And, you know, we've evolved for millions of years to combat infections and to combat cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, all of us right now sitting in this audience uh, have cells that are likely precancerous. And the reason why they don't advance is because 99.9% .9 of the time, your body's immune system can recognize it and eliminate it. And optimizing those basic functions of your immune system are the core of the immunotherapy technologies that we have today. So getting those to where they are going to be is a huge area of ours. Uh, it's an imperfect analogy, but it's a little bit akin to say software in the early 80s, mm -hmm. uh, where it's still you know, the province of uh, you know, those who really are a little bit geekier. Right. And it's not really quite disseminated yet, but you can see the potential where it's going. And I would say the last area that we're focused on quite a lot is digital health, uh, which is really a little bit more on the tech side of things. Mm -hmm. This is enabling services for clinical trial optimization, for care in the home, really to uh, get patients what they need when they're in a clinical care setting, but also to try to help optimize the entire clinical trial system, which is wildly inefficient and runs on paper. It is still in the analog world. It's kind of amazing if you've ever been to a hospital lately, and I certainly hope you haven't, but it's kind of stunning. It's sort of like a time machine. You go back to the late 80s, and it's something that we just find completely unacceptable because uh, you know, the cost of patients are, are just too, too great. Sure, I mean, everything about the hospital system is so anachronistic. It is just you know, gobsmacking. But uh, what are you um, maybe seeing that it gives you hope about you know, sort of the, uh, uh, regarding the dem democratization of clinical trials. I feel like I've been hearing about this for years. Obviously, we heard a little bit, about, a little bit more about it during COVID. Um, but what, uh, are there any companies in particular that you're excited about or um, you know, software systems that you think are actually like, making an impact? Or is oh, this totally. OK, absolutely. 3% uh, of cancer patients are in clinical trials. I just want to start with that statistic, which is just three. really low, yeah. really, really low. And the reasons for this are quite interesting. Right now, most trials happen at major academic hospitals. If you're a big pharmaceutical company, that's where you go to recruit. And patient recruitment is by far the most costly and most time intensive part of that whole process. Now, the good news is there was a law passed a while ago that says that you cannot really pay people to be in your trials which is great because that could be abused quite easily if you had to you know, get financially induced to be in a trial. Right. Thank goodness that's not the case. However, that's actually tilted a bit too much because now it's really difficult for people to get reimbursed for things like transportation, housing, work. and work. Yeah. And when you're a patient, those can often be prohibitive costs. Mm. So what we've seen is the data we get is often really wealthy people who are Caucasian. And as we all know, that's a very narrow data set. Right. So what's happened, and COVID's been the key accelerant for this, is when COVID hit, you know, cancer patients especially can't go to hospitals because they're full of COVID patients and they're immunosuppressed and they're very vulnerable. So trials got decentralized out into the private physician offices. Mm -hmm. And this made it so much more accessible. We've seen a massive uptick in participation uh, there's two really good companies right now that are doing this, uh, Medable and Section 32, but there's quite a lot more that are taking it even further. And that's actually care in the home, which is great for some places. 
uh, and all types of other interesting new technologies to really bring us not into academic centers, but really meeting us where we are. That's great. You know, I do wonder uh, on that front if, because of what happened during COVID, um, there have been challenges just in terms of, you know, trust in science and even if clinical trials are being made available, if people who should be partaking them are partaking them. I'm sure you don't have a silver bullet here, but I'm just wondering how much you think what went on set us back, if at all. I think it's a big deal. Uh, trust in science, they've been pulling this for about 50 years. It's, uh, it's not an all-time low, but it's close. And it is totally unacceptable to us that that's actually happening, particularly at this moment when we're actually seeing some efficacy finally in the cancer vaccine space. Uh, of course, vaccines have really been lambasted by, uh, you know, some folks who find them very unsafe. Mm. It's been a long-term goal to actually get your immune system to recognize cancer preemptively like it would for an infectious disease, which is, of course, why you get vaccines. Uh, just a few months ago, there was an early phase one trial published, this is in the New York Times, that showed a 50% response in pancreatic cancer. 50%. It's wow. never happened before. It's and, an and pancreatic cancer is one of the hardest things to diagnose, right? I feel like it's... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's one of the hardest to diagnose. Yeah. It has like every... It's a desert of success with therapies. Nothing ever works yeah. there. It's an early, you know, it's an early phase one. It was only six out of 12 patients, so a very small sample size. But no one's ever really seen that before. So even right now in some of the most difficult cancers, some of those new ideas are taking off. So the last thing any of us would want to see is a great cancer vaccine running into a lot of vaccine skepticism. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of other stuff that I know interests you, and I think, again, some people in the audience will be well acquainted with, but others won't. You know, we were talking backstage about genetic engineering, and I was saying that kind of brings to mind, you know, Dolly the sheep and designer babies. So maybe if you could dis disabuse uh, uh, anyone in the audience who's uh, sort of worried about those two words together, uh, what's happening on that front and what excites you, that would be great. Absolutely. Um, well, first of all, I think it's worth noting that these ethical concerns are really healthy to have. Uh, the, one of the key pioneers, uh, Jennifer Downey, who's right next door in Berkeley has been really on the front lines of suggesting that we need to be, you know, doing research here with a lot of oversight, a lot of caution, and a lot of deliberation. Uh, and I could not agree more. And she's the most qualified person in the world to think so. Uh, however, right now, we are very, very, very far away from the, you know, designer baby scenario. Uh, what we have right now is the early stages of gene editing technology. So a good way to think about this is if you think of ultimate gene editing as like copy-paste, you know, you have a bad thing, you want to replace it with a good thing. Mm -hmm. We are right now about 50% of the way there. We can cut with great single gene specificity, and that we can do quite well. But we can't paste. We're actually, we're not good at putting in something better. So just off the bat, I would say our technology, you know, full stack for what we need to do is still very incomplete. And that's something that we're funding research on and it's an area that we're very focused on. However, there's quite a lot that you can do with eliminating single things. So for instance, sickle cell anemia is a major disease, uh, particularly in the African-American population here. And it's caused by a single point mutation uh, in your red blood cells. And it actually is the case where if you can knock out that one bad gene, your other, it's, and it's a dominant gene, your recessive gene, which is normal, uh, can function well. And we're seeing early data of this disease actually being cured, uh, truly cured with wow. this single gene knockout. So right now there's several diseases that are, you know, they're called autosomal dominant, where it's one bad copy. Mm -hmm. um, Huntington's disease, which is a horrible uh, neurodegenerative disease. Uh, sickle cell is a great example as well. Uh, these things can be really knocked out with just single gene specificity, and we're already starting to see some of that. That's so those are the areas where we get really excited, and right now that's probably the limits of what we can do right now in humans. Okay, great. Well, that's, that sounds significant. Um, what about epigenetic engineering? That's another thing that came up on our call, and I was like, read, explain it to me. <laughs> Tell me what's, what's so exciting there and, and maybe what you're funding. I'd love to. It's, it's actually one of the areas that we're the most excited about. So if you think about epigenetics, a good way to, to kind of mentally model it is 
uh, every cell in your body has the same DNA, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but clearly, you know, your liver is significantly different than your skin. So the way that that works is, uh, if you remember biology, uh, your, your chromosomes, and you have uh, 26 of them, uh, you basically uh, have your DNA rolled together with these uh, various proteins. And you can chemically, without changing the DNA, turn on or off various areas of the genome. So your skin cell will just turn off all the liver genes. It doesn't need it, right? Well, how that works can actually now be perturbed. And we can, we can change it a bit. And it turns out a lot of diseases are not caused by mutations or by the wrong gene. They're caused because gene expression goes down. Mm -hmm. A lot of neurodegenerative diseases, and actually a lot of autoimmune diseases, are caused because your immune system slows and it becomes exhausted. And it hasn't changed genetically. The expression levels go way down. And with what we're doing now, uh, we can actually turn it back up. You can create a dial. And some other diseases, of course, are caused by things becoming hyperactive. So you, in those cases, you want to do the inverse. Mm. And that dial is really interesting. And you can actually touch a whole new class of diseases with it that are much you know, more interesting than just actually going in and changing things. So that's another area that is distinct from gene editing, but it's actually probably going to happen in the clinic closer just because the safety is a lot better. Great. Um, I guess with either of these, um, are there sort of downsides that concern you? Uh, I mean, I, I mentioned sort of the obvious sort of cartoonish version of the concern about genetic en engineering, but uh, with epigenetic engineering, are there sort of concerns that you have about it being, um, I don't know, used in wrong-headed ways? Of course. Now, with any type of uh, genetic or epigenetic mm -hmm. perturbation, you're going to have to have really clear ethical guidelines for all this, which mm -hmm. is why uh, you know, all of our companies publish data, uh, all of our academics publish everything, uh, and there's a really good ethical framework that's been developed internationally about mm -hmm. how these things need to be developed, how they need to be uh, disseminated and shared. Uh, and I'm happy to say that right now, everyone is really focused on mainly two areas. One is disease mitigation and one is climate change. Uh, and there's actually huge applicability in both of those. Uh, and that's really where I'm spending all my time. That's great. And tell me about the impacts of AI on, on what you're doing. I saw today that uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla yeah. Chan announced that they're putting, I think, like $100 million into this generative AI you know, computing power thingy. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm just wondering if that's something that you've talked to them about or following, and just generally speaking, you know, what you expect the implications are here. Sure. Uh, so Steve Quake, who's the uh, scientific director of uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, mm. uh, is someone who I interact with quite a bit professionally, absolute rock star, yeah. um, and, and his predecessor was as well. So they have some great people there. What they have done uh, is actually, you know, in the last 10 years with building what they call a cell atlas at different universities is the perfect uh, data set to actually put AI on top of. So to, just to answer your first question, what are we seeing with AI right now? It's pretty remarkable. Uh, what we're seeing is AI is making scientists significantly more productive uh, by accelerating research, and it's also probably going to be accompanying them as they come up with different theses. So I'd say the two mechanisms of that is first, uh, what we're seeing is a lot of great modeling, and this is what CZI is going to be working on, uh, modeling protein folding, modeling genetic engineering, and doing that in actually a, a real 360 cell is going to accelerate development tremendously. It's, it's hard to put a number on it, but it's, it's a huge shift. Uh, and the second version, though, is really looking through all the scientific literature that's been published. I mean, when you're in medical school, you know, part of your job is to try to absorb all the scientific literature that, you know, has ever really been, you know, been made available, which is pretty impossible to do for a single person. And now what we're seeing is once that is actually filtered through a lot of really good next-gen AI algorithms, that is actually yielding insights that are getting to be pretty close to as good as what humans can do. And if you extrapolate out a few years, it'll probably be something that'll accompany researchers. Terrific. Um, you know, I just wanted to ask you, so you've been doing this for five, seven years longer, possibly. 
Um, what is the most impactful investment that you've made to date? Oh, great question. Uh, we've been doing this for eight years, and I would say by far the most impactful, I'll say a grant and investment. So there's a grant that we did uh, at Yale, which I'm extremely proud of, which worked with uh, their main hospital system to actually get clinical trial representation uh, from across the state from a lot of uh, physician providers. Uh, it worked great in Connecticut because it's a small state with like kind of one big academic medical hub in it. Mm. And they actually got uh, representation to be demographically proportional, which I'm really, really proud of. Uh, that's a first for, for that entire institution. And on the company side, I would say one of the company that we're probably the most proud of is a one called Tune Therapeutics. It's one in the epigenetic editing space. It's something that we, it was our first incubation that my team did before we, we, uh, we joined Yosemite while we were at Emerson. And it was, I'm really proud of it because at the level that we're at across all these labs, we were able to see connections that were obscure to even the best researchers in the world. Uh, we paired up the best expert on this type of editing plus the delivery mechanisms that you're gonna need to get into cells and they didn't even know each other. So we actually introduced them in my living room uh, and sketched out the business plan. And I'm just proud to say it's uh, really become a leader in the space in the last three years. Terrific. And, um, you know, so you mentioned incubating this company. Is incubation a big part of what you're going to be doing at Yosemite? And, and if so, how does that sort of differ when you're talking about giving these very early stage grants to scientists? Um, I guess, should they be worried that you're going to be competing with them? Uh, we don't think so at all. So, of course, we incubation is a huge part of what we do. Mm. Uh, as you can imagine, scientists really begin in this journey because they want to see a change in patients. Mm. Uh, they're not in this to make a lot of money or necessarily to have a great academic post. They're really in it to solve a problem. Mm. And companies are the only vehicle that exists to really do that at scale. So entrepreneurs and academics could not be more excited uh, to actually get things into the market as quickly as possible. And for us, uh, we, since we take no IP or royalty strings at all, our view is that we hope to be you know, their first port of call. However, the onus is on us to earn it. Mm. If they go with another firm, that is because we haven't earned it and we need to do better. And do you have a lot of competition. I mean, obviously, there are lots of you know health sciences investors. Are, are more people? I mean, I feel like I'm talking to more people who are focused on or very interested in learning about the intersection of AI and healthcare. Are you seeing that on the ground? Absolutely. However, one big difference between uh, tech and biotech is that uh, in the life sciences, early companies are much more capital intensive mm -hmm. than what you have in the early stage on the tech side. So yes, it's competitive, but elbows are a little less sharp mm -hmm. simply because a Series A, it will not be $6 million. It'll be closer probably to $50 million. Right. Um, and uh, in terms of, I guess, what you are going to be funding at Emerson, so it's a $200 million fund. Um, have you made any investments yet? Yes, I'm proud to say we, we have. Uh, we had a few things that we were... Uh, really, really excited to debut with. Uh, and those include a next generation gene editing delivery platform, uh, a really interesting new startup that uh, just came out of MIT, uh, and another one that is out of Yale that we're uh, about to close. And I can't talk about that one yet because it's not done, but it's going to be really, really cool. Well, based on your sort of view into all of these different sort of verticals, do you have any reason to think that cancer will not be a chronic disease versus fatal in the next 25 years. I mean, what is your, you, I think you, I've heard you say something about the next century, but do you think we could even be closer or do you think even that's maybe too ambitious? Well, I'm all for being ambitious. Uh, biotech is never as linear as tech. It's always actually, it abounds in mystery and difficulty, which can be very exciting. Uh, what I believe is that the major cancers which claim most lives are right now seeing the greatest progress. And that really enervates me. Um, that's lung, it's breast, it's prostate, colon. Those are the really, really big killers. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that in the next 20 years, we're going to see a very significant decrease in mortality there. Uh, of course, cancer is a very heterogeneous population, so there will be a few outliers. You know, if I had to speculate, uh, cancers that, like 
ovarian, brain, and unfortunately pancreatic, mm -hmm. are going to be a bit more difficult. Uh, they have low mutational rates, they're hard to detect, uh, they have these weird, horrible microenvironments that are very suppressive to anything, you know, really getting in there. And I think, unfortunately, those will likely sort of be the final outliers. Uh, and we will stay on to the end here at Yosemite. We are not going anywhere. Um, we're really not going to go out of business until uh, we see mortality decline to a level that people don't die of cancer anymore. I love it. Um, Reed, uh, we're going to have to go here in a second, but I also just wanted to talk to you as a Bay Area native. Yes. The San Francisco Bay Area has obviously gotten a lot of grief. Uh, I'm just wondering, do you want to sort of tell us why you think people have it wrong? Well, I am likely the most biased person you're ever going to talk to. Because I was born in Palo Alto, I went to Stanford, and I very proudly have lived in San Francisco for the last nine years. Uh, it is, I think Bay Area is the most beautiful place in the world, and it will always be home. You know, the Bay Area, if you look historically, has been a, a lot like a phoenix. It has had booms and busts that have been extremely uh, like volatile all throughout its history. And every time, you know, there's a bit of a downturn, there's always a lot of naysayers and, oh, you know, this is the end, what were we thinking? And consistently that has been proved wrong. And already, I promise you, already there are companies, young companies that are very excited to be here, talent that doesn't want to look anywhere else, and capital. And you mentioned AI earlier. AI is not happening in other parts of the country. Right. It's happening here in San Francisco. Yeah. No, it's exciting, and, and you can just see the energy. I mean, obviously at this show, uh, but elsewhere, I mean, the restaurants are buzzing, people are out on the streets, and it's just, it feels like the city has really come back. I mean, obviously we have problems to overcome, but. That's exactly right. Well, yeah. uh, I see we're at time. I actually just want to end by thanking oh, you sure. for putting on such a wonderful uh, inaugural event. Oh, Congratulations. thanks, thanks. It's amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you all.